director of the Black Youth Project 100, which is an activist member-led organization of black 18 to 35 year olds dedicated to creating justice and freedom for all black people. Charlene is a political organizer and writer with over 10 years experience in racial justice, feminist, and youth leadership development movement work. Her passion for developing young leaders has led her to work on immigrant rights, economic justice, and civil rights campaigns nationwide. She's led grassroots and digital strategy campaigns for national progressive organizations, including the Center for Community Change, the Women's Media Center, colorofchange.org, and National People's Action. She earned her BA in History and International Studies from Illinois Wesleyan University and a Master's in Social Work from Washington University in St. Louis. And Charlene was born and raised on the south side of Chicago, where she currently resides. Join me in welcoming Charlene Carruthers. Good afternoon. I am absolutely uh, honored and I feel blessed to be able to be a part of this uh, event this afternoon and would like to thank all of you for showing up in this weather and braving it like true Chicagoans. Um, also wanna, would like to thank Tracy Matthews for such a gracious uh, invitation and opportunity. And before I share uh, all of Dr. West's uh, accolades, I want to share a, a quick story that I learned from my sister and comrade Ashley Yates who is one of the most amazing young leaders and organizers in Ferguson. Ashley told me when Dr. West came to Ferguson uh, during Ferguson October weekend, uh, there were lots of cameras, right, as you can imagine. And everyone wanted to talk to Dr. West because Dr. West came in there just blazing, like ready to just get, get, like, get down nitty gritty with the young people who were the reason why everyone was even showing up and why everyone even knew about Ferguson, right? And so cameras, there was this one particular interview with CNN, and they only, they, uh, they wanted to talk to Dr. West. And he said, well, I'm not talking without the young people. This is what Ashley told me. He's like, I'm not talking without the young people. I will talk to you if Ashley comes with me. And so, you know, lots of people, there is just, just rhetoric when they talk about supporting young people. And so in the tradition of Ella Baker, Dr. West brought Ashley with him. And each time the cameras tried to divert the attention only to Dr. West and not and just completely ignore Ashley, he brought Ashley into the conversation. He's like, no, you need to talk to Ashley. Any question, he pointed to Ashley. Well, what's going on? Oh, well, Ashley, talk to Ashley every single time. And that, that is action, that's, that's words in action, values in action, and that's what Dr. West is about, right? Lots of people talk the talk, but Dr. West actually walks the walk, right? So, what you also must know about Dr. West, if you don't know, is that he's a prominent and provocative democratic intellectual. Provocative to, to say the least, right? A current professor at Union Theological Seminary, he has also taught at Yale, Harvard, and Princeton. He is the recipient of more than 20 honorary degrees. He is the author of 20 books, including Race Matters, Democracy Matters, The Memoir, Brother West, Living and Loving Out Loud, and most recently, Black Prophetic Fire. He appears frequently on Real Time with Bill Maher, The Colbert Report, Democracy Now!, CNN, C-SPAN, and other national and international media. He lives in New York City. Wes will discuss his new book, The Radical King, an edited anthology of Martin Luther King Jr.'s writings. Wes highlights King's anti-war stance, his defense of the poor, his support of labor movements, and his opposition to global imperialism as evidence that King was, far, was a far more radical figure than it is acknowledged today. The book, this book, unearths a radical king that we can no longer sanitize, Wes writes. So please, please join me in a beautiful round of applause for Dr. Cornell West. What a blessing to be here, University of Chicago, Rockefeller Chapel on the south side of Chicago. Oh, how blessed I am, my dear sister Charlene Crothers. I want to thank her, not just for those kind words, but I want to thank her for her leadership, building on the rich legacy of the inimitable Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, and so many others. And of course, when I think of the black youth 
100 Project, I think of the inimitable Professor Kathy Cohen. Give it up for Professor Cohen. Ooh, what high quality combination of intellectual engagement and always focus on what's happening on the street. I want to thank Sister Tracy Matthews for facilitating my coming. She's been so wonderful with both the staff here at the chapel as well as the center. I want you to send my love and respect to my dear brother Michael Dawson. I'm told he just got back from the Big Apple and he's feeling under the weather. So I'm praying for him. Because even as a Jesus-loving free black man, my prayers don't always connect, but it's the aspiration and it's the intention and motivation. So I know he's going to bounce back strong. Give it up for Professor Michael Dawson and Sister Tracy Matthews. Indeed, indeed. I see one of my favorite people in the world, and Professor Matthew Briones and Sister Candace and Sister... Ella West, and she's, her daughter's named after Ella Baker, and a Negro named Cornell, and that's a hell of a combination. Stand up, all three of you all, stand up. All three of you stand up. Give it up, give it up for the three. Distinguished Professor Matthew Briones, he's my teaching fellow at Harvard University years ago, strong as ever, and I see Brother Bill Ayers and Sister Bernadette Dawn. Love you all. Give it up for both of them. Give it up for both of them. Long distance runners still holding up that bloodstained banner for justice. I got my beacon folk here with Sister Pam, Brother Tom. It's good to see you. I know Brother Nate is here somewhere. He's my dear brother. Where's Brother Nate? Where's Brother Nate? Stand up, Brother Nate. He's standing somewhere. <laughs> With Brother Dwight. Now, I thank each and every one of you for coming out today. I did believe that when I arrived this morning that there would be about 12 of us. <laughs> but that's all right. Because I'll say exactly the same thing about my dear brother Martin Luther King, Jr., that when I hear his name, I just shake and tremble and shiver and quiver. Why? Because he exemplifies such high levels of courage and vision, service to others, finding joy in serving others, and sacrifice. When you think of Martin, just think of him in that paddy wagon in the dark with a German shepherd four and a half hours biting at him, the same amount of time as our dear brother Michael Brown's body lay on that street in Ferguson. And I talked to Andy Young, and he said, Brother Wes, when Martin stepped out of that paddy wagon, it was just me and Daddy King. He said, it looked as if he'd had a nervous breakdown. He could not walk straight. And he had one sentence on his lips. He said, this is the cross we must bear for the freedom of our people. I see that's love concretized. That's love exemplified. That's love enacted. And Martin Luther King Jr. is in no way an isolated individual to be put on a pedestal for us to be spectators, to look at him as if he's part of a museum piece. He's part of a tradition. He is a wave in an ocean. And we're here to ensure that never again can he be deodorized. We're going to keep it funky. <laughs> oh, yes. Martin King was a funk master. Because he knew the fundamental question as always, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creature born between urine and feces? It's who we are. We all emerge in the funk, the love push that got us out. And we're not here that long. One day our bodies will be the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. That's funky too. 
And the question is, who are you going to be in that short time between womb and tomb? And Martin Luther King Jr. would be the first to say, always situate me, contextualize me, humanize me in relation to those who came before. Because I know you would agree with me, I am who I am because somebody loved me. Somebody cared for me. Somebody attended to me. The highest status I'll ever have is to be the second son of the late Clifton and the present Irene and to be a product of Shiloh Baptist Church on the chocolate side of Sacramento, California. All that love coming at me from Reverend Willie P. Cook and Deacon Hinton and Sarah Ray, Sunday school and vacation Bible school teacher. I didn't need to get to Harvard and Princeton to understand what it means to wrestle with, with my humanity. What Martin King comes out of, Alberta Williams King, her womb, PK, preacher's kid, Mary's daddy king, shaped by that precious family, brother A.D., sister Christine, distinguished professor Spellman, just retired a few months ago. Morehouse College, every time we say the word Morehouse College, we ought to just be silent for a while. As they say, you can always tell a Morehouse man, but you can't tell him much. <laughs> Consecrated space for black struggle. Benjamin Mays, my God. University of Chicago PhD, alongside Sinclair Drake and other giants that allowed black folks to matriculate through this place, even given its own vicious legacy of white supremacy. <laughs> Still operating, but making movement. And then on the Crozier Theological Seminary with the white teachers who took him seriously so seriously that he could be wrong as well as right. And on to Boston University and writing that magnificent dissertation on Paul Tillich and Henry Nelson Wyman. Wyman, another professor, University of Chicago Divinity School. Martin Luther King Jr. wave in an ocean. He's part and parcel of what the Isley brothers call a caravan of love because Martin Luther King Jr. was somebody who had the courage to say, I could choose to be part of this tradition of a people who've been terrorized and traumatized and stigmatized for 400 years, but still choose love of truth and love of justice and love of neighbor. And for Brother Martin, it was even love of enemy. You don't try that one on your own. You're going to need some thick grace for that. But it's a tradition that talks explicitly about love and how magnificent it is that black people, one of the most, if not the most hated people in the modern world, dish out figures like John Coltrane, Love Supreme. Nina Simone, Mississippi, Goddamn. Curtis Mayfield. The love train of people get ready. That gentle genius from the west side of Chicago. Martin King is part of that wave, y'all. He's not here to be elevated into being some deity of God. He's a human being who was deeply loved, and he chose to be part of that caravan of love. And he understood it as the way of the cross. He's not first and foremost a civil rights activist. He's first and foremost a free black man who decided to make Jesus his choice and believed that the kingdom of God was to be understood as the beloved community and he heard every year if the kingdom of God is within you then everywhere you go you ought to leave a little heaven behind. I mean he was convinced that to be human was to spread what our Jewish brothers and sisters call hesed loving kindness to the orphan, to the widow, 
to the fatherless, to the motherless, to the poor, to working people, to the prisoners. We can go on and on to our gay brothers and lesbian sisters, to our indigenous brothers and sisters, to the Dalit brothers and sisters in India, to Palestinian brothers and sisters under Israeli occupation, those in Tibet dealing with Chinese occupation, Kurds dealing with Iraqi occupation, all the folk who are subordinated, dominated, exploited, they have a priority in the tradition that Martin Luther King Jr. learned at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Now we know, of course, that Christians have no monopoly on this. Given the Christian vicious history of atrocities and barbarities and bestialities against other folk, be they Jews or Muslims or agnostics or a whole host of others. No doubt about that. Martin understood that very well, but he still decided to choose the way of the cross. And by cross, he meant unarmed truth, unconditional love, and the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak. Just like he would say over and over again, justice is what love looks like in public. And I would add tenderness is what love feels like in private. Because Martin Luther King Jr. came from a black people who were fundamentally committed to a militant tenderness. What did Martin say about Malcolm X when he, when he was shot? in Audubon room. Malcolm had such a sweet spirit. I was thinking about that in relation to my dear brother, Haki Mahabute, one of the legendary poets and educators, not just in Chicago, but in the whole country. Yes, give it up for brother Haki. He's a son of Malcolm X. But he and Malcolm have a tenderness and a sweetness. Martin understood that. I try to remind young folk these days, when I hear him talking about say my name, say my name, no, Otis Redden said try a little tenderness. <laughs> and we're going to get to that, this spiritual and cultural war on the black youth. Ferguson is one response, but it's not just political, it's not just arbitrary policing. It has to do with the low quality of music and the inability to gain access to structures of feeling and value that allow you to straighten your back up and understand what it is to be a promoter of militant tenderness. Black folk wouldn't be who we are. We couldn't straighten our backs up. We couldn't tell the truth, bear witness if we didn't have tenderness coming our way, not just in terms of touch and hug, but also in terms of patience. To generate self-respect and generate self-confidence, that's the threat all the time for the status quo because black rage, when channeled through love and justice, always makes the elite, the oligarchs and plutocrats tremble in their boots because they know the history of these people oh lord they've known every kind of terrorism every kind of trauma every kind of stigma when they wake up when they straighten their backs up lo and behold something is going on something is happening as martin used to say anytime those sly stone called everyday people straighten their backs up they're going somewhere because folk can't ride your back unless it's bent and the history of black people is what? A history in which folk has attempted to be niggerized. Teach them they're less moral. Teach them they're less beautiful. Teach them they're less intelligent. Teach them to be so afraid and intimidated and, and scared that they walk around laughing when it ain't funny and scratching when it don't itch. And wearing the mask just to get over, to gain access to middle class status. But if it's just a matter of being successful and still adjusted, well adjusted to injustice, you're still suffering from a spiritual malnutrition and emptiness of the soul. Now, I just saw my dear brother Flager walk in. Where is brother Flager? There he is. Give it up for brother Father Flager. He's my dear brother. Love this brother deeply. St. Sabina in the house. St. Sabina in the house. That's what, be there at the end of February. Indeed, indeed. He understands as a vanilla brother, he's in the business of myself and others of trying to denigerize black people, to take the fear out of them, 
Quit being so afraid and intimidated. Straighten your back up. Tell the truth. Bear witness. Take a risk. And this is true for the black professional class. It's been re -niggerized. You got folk with big houses and big mansions and big cars, and they're still scared. They're still intimidated. They're still afraid to tell the truth. <laughs> if Martin came back, he said, oh, look at all of these highly successful folk. I want to know what they're faithful to. Don't tell me about your success. Tell me how you're using your success. That's Martin Luther King, Jr. It's true. It's gonna generate a whole wave of peacocks. Look at me, look at me. I'm the first black this, I'm the first brown that. And I could hear Martin say, peacocks strut because they can't fly. I want to know what is the quality of your service to the least of these echoes of the 25th chapter of Matthew. That's Martin Luther King Jr. And let us be very, very clear that when Martin Luther King Jr. died, 72% of Americans disapproved of him, 55% of black people disapproved of him. So everybody loves him now that the worms got his body, but he, when he was alive, people were afraid of him. Why? Because his love was so deep. And any time you love folk, you hate the fact they're being treated unjustly. You loathe the fact they're being treated unfairly. And if you don't say something, the rocks are going to cry out. And Martin is not by himself. He had Stokely Carmichael there, the Trinidadian brother, pushing him. Nobody likes Stokely when it comes to a love affair with black people. Martin and Stokely like wet on water. Disagreed, especially on the God quest. Stokely was a secular brother like Richard Wright and so many other the great black secular thinkers. But they came together in terms of not being afraid. One way of trying to keep track of Martin Luther King Jr.'s connection to the movement, the ways in which the movement made him and the ways in which he helped make the movement, they go hand in hand is his response to the four questions of the greatest public intellectual in the history of the American empire. I'm talking about W.E.B. Du Bois. 1957, Du Bois has just emerged from a U.S. court in handcuffs, taking his passport, got him under house arrest. He's able to visit only one other black brother who's also under house arrest in Philadelphia named the great Paul Robes. And they would sit, the professor and the pupil, in the recent book, talks about their conversations. The boy says, I want to pass on love letters to the younger generation. Just like we're trying to pass on love letters to the Ferguson generation. He says, keep this legacy alive. He says, but there's four questions I've been wrestling with all of my life. And in that first novel, The Ordeal of Manzart, you turn the page, 275, what do you see? He said, the first question, how shall integrity meet oppression? Integrity. The great history of black people in America is what? In the face of terror, trauma, and stigma, we aspire at our best to integrity. Even if we're defeated momentarily, we'd rather go down with our integrity than win and be a gangster like those who gangsterize us. <laughs> integrity. The second question, what does honesty do in the face of deception? Because white supremacy is nothing but a lie. It's a vicious lie, but it lives in every nook and cranny of American life, and it's a global phenomenon be even beyond national boundaries. Can you be honest about it? That's what James Baldwin says in that last line of the preface, the notes of a native son. All I want to be is a writer and an honest man. And, of course, the highest expressions, the voice of a David Ruffin. Oh, Wanda, a Sheila Hutchinson of the emotions uh, of the Dales, the mighty Dales. What do you hear in those voices? 
integrity, honesty, vulnerability, power, strength. They're not just entertainers. They're love warriors, too. It's expressed in an artistic way in the same way Martin King and Malcolm X and Fannie Lou Hamer were love warriors expressed in a political and social way. But they're all interconnected and intertwined. Third question, what does decency do in the face of insult? And the last one, how does virtue meet brute force? Keep track of all four of those and think about Martin Luther King Jr. and the tradition that produced him. A people, a despised, dishonored, devalued people mustering the courage to attempt to live lives of integrity, honesty, decency, and a sense of virtue in face of oppression, deception, lies, mendacity, in face of insult, assault, attack, psychic, physical, political, and then brute force, repression, crushed, incarcerated, maimed, on parole, on probation, the repressive apparatus of the nation state coming at you in a raw and coarse way. One of the things we love about Martin is what? That he was willing to stand up in the face of that raw repressive apparatus. Well, Beginning in January 1956, every day the FBI had him under surveillance. We find out that his photographer who took on over 10,000 pictures of him was an FBI informant too. Martin, how you doing, brother? It's about to love, Brother West. It's about to love University of Chicago, Rockefeller Chapel. Do you have what it takes to muster that kind of love of truth, love of justice, love of neighbor? I can't do it by myself. I got to be part of a tradition. I got to remember my grandmama. I got to connect with my father. I want to put a smile on my aunt's face. Memory, Sankofa. Refuse to look forward until you look back and understand what is the wind at your back? Who you gonna really be faithful to? Are you just tied to your own egocentric predicament or do you understand yourself as somehow being able to muster this kind of courage because somebody else did it before you? That's what we love about Mark. And that's what makes it so difficult to come to terms with it, especially these days. Because we don't live in an age of integrity, we live in an age of cupidity. It's love of money. Wu-Tang Clan is right, it's cream. Cash rules everything around me, but it doesn't have to rule me, it's around me. But it's all about our Benjamins. Everybody for sale. Everything for sale. Folk highly talented, they just want to be smart with dollars. They don't want to be wise with compassion. One of the highest things you can say about young folk these days, they so smart. I could hear Martin say, I'm not impressed. I knew smart Nazis. I knew smart white supremacists. I knew smart homophobes. I knew smart patriarchs. I don't want just smartness. I want some wisdom and some compassion and some willingness to sacrifice. That's something different. Not impressed. Don't tell me how many dollars you got. So what you got so many dollars? What focus do you have? What are your priorities in life? What kind of human being are you? That's the tradition that produced Martin. He knew when Malcolm was shot, he only had $151 in his pocket. That's all he owned. So what? We'll always remember Malcolm X because of the depth of his love. Even when the white mainstream says he was a hater. No, he was hating the treatment of black people. That brother had a love in him that cut so deep we don't have a language for it. That's why Martin and Martin, Malcolm and Martin go hand in hand. June the 27th, 1964, Malcolm X receives a message from Martin Luther King Jr. How do we know? FBI files. You understand, Brother Bill. Oh, the FBI got history of all of us. It's a compliment. 
the recent book by William Maxwell on the ghost readers of J. Edgar Hoover, how it framed African-American lit literature because they got 1,200 pages on Baldwin, 1,004 pages on Lorraine Hansberry. They got dissertations written on black novels in the FBI. Some of them doing more work than professors. <laughs> Why? Because they know it's a threat, especially the Lorraine Hansberrys and the James Baldwins. We won't get into some of the other writers who capitulated and some of them sold their souls for a mess of pottage just to be accepted by a white mainstream that still viewed them as exotic objects rather than human beings. Even when you're embraced, if you're not respected, there's a problem. And if you think you're respected, but they disrespected Jamal and Letitia on the block, you better get off the symbolic crack pipe and come to your senses. So it's not just a matter of the exceptional Negroes at the top breaking the glass ceiling when too many locked in the basement still. Socially neglected, economically abandoned. And that's precisely that Martin's response to Du Bois's questions would be, here in this particular moment, in the age of our dear brother Obama, I got a ride today from the taxi. I said, I'm going to the Hyatt on the south side. And my dear brother said, oh, that's the president's neighborhood. I said, I could never tell based on his priorities. I could never tell. Wall Street's doing well. Stock market breaking record. Hedge bank, hedge fund investors break dancing to the bank. <laughs> Poverty rates increase. Schools still decrepit, militarized. No arts program, so when they get there, they can't learn to play the instruments. So you're not going to get no Ohio players. You're not going to get Charles Watts. Watt 103rd Street Rhythm Band, you're not going to get James Brown's band. They got to use computers because they can't play the instruments. And some of their singers will make millions of dollars and can't sing in tune. Because it's not a matter of getting it right. It's a matter of image. It's PR. It's part of the culture of superficial spectacle. You just want to get over by any means. You're not concerned about integrity. You're just concerned about cupidity because you turn, you tied to the same oligarchs and plutocrats who run radio, video, recording, and live performance. And all they want is to use you as a means by which they make big money as if your tradition is disposable. I can't stand it. I don't know about you. I can't stand it. And we wonder why the young folk don't have groups like the Delphonics or the Dramatics or Enchantment or the Jones Girls or the Marvelettes or the Temptations where you have to cultivate your craft, lift your voice, blend it with other voices and try to stir people's souls, not just stimulate their bodies. Oh, I'm in Chicago. This is soul-stirring country. Lou Rawls, Johnny Taylor, Sam Cooke, my God. All of these rich, deep, Magnificent Mississippi Negroes came up here and transformed this city with the blue sensibilities of geniuses like B.B. King and so many others. Let's just be honest about it. The Martin Luther King Jr. blues man. Because the blues is fundamentally about catastrophe. And the king of the blues B.B. King says, nobody loves me but my mama, and she might be jiving too. <laughs> That's catastrophic. <laughs> That's like Sophocles' Antigone in the classic of our Greek brothers and sisters. Cat catastrophic. Martin Luther King Jr. would be concerned about ecological catastrophe, impending, driven by corporate greed sense of domination. Martin Luther King Jr. would be concerned about impending nuclear catastrophe. We still got 17,500 nuclear warheads. Russia still got over 10,000. He'd be concerned about xenophobia in whatever form. That's a moral catastrophe. 
It could be white supremacy. It could be anti-Jewish hatred, anti-Arab hatred, anti-Muslim hatred, and especially these days, our Muslim brothers and sisters who are often cast in such a way that ISIS and Al-Qaeda somehow speaks for all of them. What a lie, what a lie, what a lie. Yes, we got to keep track of gangsters. We have gangsters in all of our communities. Martin Luther King Jr. would say over and over again, sinner that I am, he understands that he's wrestling with something inside of him. And I know I was a gangster before I met Jesus, and now I'm a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. <laughs> Nothing but the Holy Ghost holding me together. You see me doing something ungodly. I told you so already. Pray for me. I got bounced back. Try again, fell again, fail better, as Samuel Beckett puts it. Try again, fell again, fail better. All of us going to die. Failures when our bodies are in the coffin. The question is, how good was our failure? If all of us fall short. I know I got my dear sister Tamika too. Beth up here. Coming out of Yale, south side of Chicago. Magnificent, young visionary, intellectual activist, very much like Charlotte's group, younger generation, be long distance runners, which means you have to be blues women and blues men, and I'm not talking about entertainers. I'm talking about being on intimate terms with catastrophe, but just like B.B. King when he sings that song, he got a smile on his face. Where does that smile come from? He got a joy that cuts so deep that it's qualitatively different than pleasure. So much of American culture is just a joyless quest for pleasure, insatiable pleasure, but no real joy that cuts deep, that can sustain you in the midst of a catastrophe. Not at all. And he's got a little help from Lucille, his guitar. But there's a connection between Lucille, that guitar, and what he heard in the genius named Robert Johnson in the Delta, or Muddy Waters. It's part of a tradition. He's not out there all by himself. He's trying to sustain the highest standards that have been bequeathed to him by those who came before. We may not know about him. White mainstream may not know about him. So what? They are still part of our memories. They're anonymous. They're nameless folk who helped cultivate our sense of self-respect and self-confidence. That's what you hear when you please plan that Lucille. And then the same love flowing out of his soul, going straight to all other people's souls who are open, no matter what color, gender, sexual orientation. It is a human thing all the way down. Martin, blues man. What do we do these days with Martin? Well, think, for example, the moment when Martin comes out against the war based on the magnificent love and pressure of Stokely Carmichael and so many others. Why? He says, because I believe Vietnamese babies have the same status as white babies or black babies or brown babies. And he learned in vacation Bible school. Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. He was fundamentalist about that. It would be nice if fundamentalist Christians were more fundamentalist about love thy neighbor. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Martin was that kind of fundamentalist. But then he wanted to organize poor people across the board. And not just bring them all together. What was he going to do? Shut Washington down. Shut it down. You're not going to operate. He said the government was a conspiracy against the poor, and poor people for so long have been neglected. It got him in a lot of trouble. When Whitney Young walked up to him and said, Martin, you setting back the black freedom movement a generation. You're moving from civil rights to something you don't know nothing about. And Martin was nonviolent, but I'm sure he almost slapped him upside the head. He's going to hold me back with Joe Frazier on him, right there on the spot. And Ralph had to hold him. He said, Brother Whitney, what you say may get you big money. 
from a foundation grant a corporation, but it won't get you a foothold in the kingdom of truth. Now that can be said for much of our leadership in America. You say what you have to say in order to keep your job and career and downplay your calling and the truth because you need your money flow and the kingdom of truth is something you hold at arm's length. Don't you know that chickens come home to roost? Don't you know you're going to reap what you sow? Don't you know that truth crushed the earth will rise again? What makes you think that somehow life is just a matter of short term pecuniary gain, obsessed with chasing dollars and has nothing to do with integrity, honesty, decency, and virtue that Du Bois was talking about. Martin was a towering figure in part because he would never sell out. Never. Malcolm too. Fannie Lou too. Curtis Mayfield too. John Coltrane sat on the third row listening to Malcolm X. Every time he came to New York, the agent said, stay away from Malcolm. Stay away from Malcolm. You're playing my favorite things. That's Rodgers and Hammerstein. You got a bestseller. You better hold on to that, John. He said, you don't understand who I am. I'm John Coltrane from Gut Bucket, Jim Crow, North Carolina. Come out of Reverend Blair. I'm somebody trying to be honest with my sound. And sometimes, as he did November 11th, 1966, Coltrane did what? He threw his horn down. He started singing. Then he stopped singing. What did he do? He beat on his chest. Rashid Ali said, Train, what's happening? He said, I'm just trying to express myself, spread the love. And the horn got limitations. <laughs> That's what Ashton and Simpson called the real thing, y'all. It's not God, it's not an attribute of God, it's a human quality. It's still falling in finite, but it's the real thing. The younger generation, Ferguson, Staten Island, hungry for the real thing. They tired of superficiality. We can march all we want, hands up, hands up, magnificent, magnificent. But how in the world are we going to have a precious black brown sister or brother shot every 28 days for the last seven years, got a black president, black attorney general, black homeland security cabinet, and can't get one federal prosecution of a policeman shooting down Jamal or Letitia or Juan or Juanita. What in the world is going on? What's happening? What is going on? I call it a that's a key sweat moment. Something, something just ain't right. And you point it out and say, oh, Brother West, you hating. You had no, I ain't hating. If you're in tight with Wall Street, that's your choice. If you choose drones to drop bombs on innocent people, 233 children counting and a baby in Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan, or Afghanistan have exactly the same value as a white baby in Newtown, Connecticut, or a brown baby on the in East Los Angeles or a black baby in the south side of Chicago. Those are choices people make. If you got massive surveillance keeping track of people's phones, if you already assassinated four Americans with no judicial review, no accountability whatsoever, those are choices. It's a question of integrity, honesty, decency, of virtue. I don't care what color you are. That's not hating on a person. That's hating injustice. Martin Luther King Jr. was a hater of injustice because he had love in his heart. That's the challenge, especially for the younger generation. It's going to be up to you to make sure that your rage is filtered through love and justice and not hatred and revenge. Much of human history is a cycle of hatred and revenge and domination and oppression. I don't care what color you are, what culture, what sexual orientation, or what civilization you are. The question is how do you create a disruption and interruption of it to create some spaces so that the dignity of those Martin love, those Malcolm love, those Fannie Lou love. There's a dear sister, one of the great freedom fighters of the 20th century, her name is Dorothy Day. She's a vanilla Catholic sister. 
She, won, she wrote one of the great eulogies of Martin Luther King Jr. Go back and look at the Catholic worker, April 5th, 1968. She said, Brother Martin learned how to die daily because he knew that love is a form of death. That any time you muster the courage to love the truth, you're going to have to examine some assumptions and presuppositions. You're going to have to let some of them go. You're going to have to examine your prejudices and prejudgments. You're going to have to let them go. And when you let those go, that is a form of death. There is no rebirth without death. There is no maturation, development, or growth without you learning how to die in order to learn how to live. The Christian New Testament says what? Christians must die daily. That's what Paul says. Paul's not right about everything, but my God, he got that one right. That Roman citizen of a vicious empire called the Roman Empire, Brother Paul got that one right. That Jewish brother got that thing right. Because black people, we have been on intimate terms with death, the social death of slavery for 244 years, just a commodity to be bought and sold. The civic death of Jim and Jane Crow Senior, we still got Jim and Jane Crow Jr. operating, prison industrial complex, segregated schools, segregated neighborhoods, segregated cultural lives. Jim Crow's still alive. Michelle Alexander got it right. She's got it right now. But to be on intimate terms with death and then our blues tradition to say we're going to not terrorize others because we're being terrorized, we're going to fight for freedom for everybody. See, we're not going to Jim Crow somebody else just because we Jim Crow. We want liberty for everybody. You see, we're not going to hate in response to hate. No, that's Martin. And even love your enemies but that I take very seriously as a Christian myself. The fact that, yes, the gangsters and the thugs, often in high places, Criminals on Wall Street, market manipulation, insider trading, fraudulent activity, not one of them go to jail. But let a poor person get caught with a crack bag, go straight to jail. My God, how it's criminal. But loving your enemies, to make sure you never freeze anybody in one space so that you trump their future, that you foreclose their sense of growth and possibility. Malcolm Little was a gangster. Elijah loved him into becoming Malcolm X. If he did not focus on that Malcolm Little, he would have died a gangster in a prison. It was the love that transformed him. And later on, he went beyond Elijah, didn't he? But that's part of the love on the chocolate side of town, that kind of love has very little status in the history of white America. We can see it in the film Selma. For the first time, you have portrayed in the mainstream theater, mainstream film, black humanity, creativity, organizing, mobilizing. It doesn't get everything right. I think it's wrong about SNCC, but okay, you can see the beauty of the black folk coming together and the dialogue ends up about what? LBJ. Because white fears, white anxieties, white interests always center the dialogue. What are they saying about me? It ain't about you. It ain't about you. It's about these black folk coming together. And when you have folk like Bill and Bernadette that say, you know what? We from the vanilla side of town. We're going to join the movement. We're not going to be allies to the movement. We're freedom fighters in our own right. We coming with other freedom fighters. We're going to sing with, with Bernice Reagan. We're going to sing with Curtis Mayfield. We a winner. Because when Curtis was talking about we a winner, when he's talking about the love trade, that's a human choice you make. You're not doing black folk a favor somehow by pitching in and fighting for black freedom. It's your definition of what you conceive yourself to be as a human being. That's what Martin was talking about. How difficult it is. And yet at the same time, we do live in many ways in a different kind of society, in some ways better, in some ways worse. And Martin would be the first to say, be prisoners of hope. 
Don't be cheap optimists. Or you run out of gas, you won't be a long distance runner. You come out of the block strong, get to the second lap, and no more gas in your tank. But certainly don't be a pessimist. Because one of the things the blues has nothing to do with is pessimism. I've been down so long that down don't worry me no more. That's why I keep keeping on. That's not pessimism. That's a realism about the catastrophe and the darkness and the willingness to keep on pushing with your integrity, with your honesty, with your decency, with your virtue. Thank you so much, Brother Martin. We love you. <laughs> Brother Martin, we need you. What a beautiful thing. God bless you all. Thank you so much. You're so patient, and my voice is about to, about to collapse on me, but you're all so kind. You're all so kind. We have a good question and answer. We got to have call and response. Got to have antiphonal form in the black context. Now, y'all know that. And my dear sister has it, absolutely. Okay. So we'll start. People who have questions to line up here or in the back, there's another microphone in the middle in the back. Thank you, Dr. West. Thank you so much. Uh, the question that I have is if you, uh, in, in a s several steps, could, could uh, speak to us about those of us who are practitioners in the field who are trying to do the best that we can yes, yes. To, uh, to guide our young people. If you could give us a, a, a plan, a course of action, very quickly, some of the things that we need to be concerned about, looking at, and being sure to do, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, no, I appreciate that question, though, brother. And that's such a, did you all hear the question in the back? You want to just say it out, out loud, though, brother? Yes, I was just saying that for those of there us who go. are kind of practitioners in the field, who are working with our youth, uh, underprivileged and disadvantaged youth, if uh, the doctor could come up with uh, a very quick overview, a plan, a course of action that he would recommend for us. Yes, indeed. I appreciate that. And really, I should have my brothers and sisters from the Black Youth Project say something about this. For me, the most important thing is we have got to let our youth know that we love them, we care for them, we focus on them, we attend to them, that they are worthy of our time and energies. And that's at the symbolic level. That was what Ferguson was about for me. I said I didn't go down to give a speech. I went down there to go to jail just to show somebody old school loves young school. OK, now how do you do that? One, you have to be persistent. We have to have a renaissance in our churches. So if you're going to have a mega church, it ought to have mega love and a mega prison ministry. <laughs> that to be a priority in our intellectual work. If you're going to be rigorous, subtle, and sophisticated, somehow you have to be able to connect it to what went into you to allow you to have such confidence in yourself, namely the young folk who need more confidence in them, themselves. And young folk would rather see sermons than hear them, right? They don't want to hear speeches. They want to see how people go going to act. They want to see how people are going to be consistent and constant. A wonderful phrase of Jane Austen, constancy. I love that phrase of my Victorian sister. <laughs> constancy, moral consistency. They're not looking for any kind of God-like presence. They're looking for human encounter, shaping, molding, taking them seriously. You see what I mean? Then we memory, give them memories. Tell him the story of John Coltrane when he came to New York after he got off his mama's couch and he encountered a genius named Theolonius Monk and Monk invited him to his house and let him sleep on the couch and taught him all kind of notes and John Coltrane said, but Monk, that sounds wrong. And Monk said, sometimes wrong is right. <laughs> That's what round midnight's about. That's what epistrophe gonna be about. I'm doing something had been done before, John. I'm finding my voice. I want you to find your voice, John. You got a contribution to make. Wasn't competitive, wasn't putting him down, wasn't talking about him. He brought him in. And what did Coltrane do as soon as he got his quartet? He got a young brother named McCoy. He could have got Red Garland. He could have got an older generation. He got young folk. He brought in a young brother named Eric Dolphy, another young brother named Archie Shepp, another young brother named Farrell Sanders. It was a young thing. We need to imitate some of our great artists and musicians. Curtis Mayfield fused with Roger Troutman after the after he heard himself in Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Roger Troutman, Ohio, computer love. 
That's right. Curtis Mayfield, genius beyond genius, intergenerational. Our young people need to know these examples so that it becomes saturated in their souls and they feel as if they're part of a great tradition. They walk around with a sense of dignity. I am part of a tradition of these great peoples, not because black people have a monopoly on truth and beauty and goodness. Everybody has access to it, but young folk need to know that there is that tradition that has made that kind of difference. So that's the beginning of an answer to your question, though, brother. But you asking the right question. You asking the right question. No doubt about it. I mean, you and I, you know, we old school. We got more originals. These young folk got too many copies. You see, they need, they need to have the courage to be originals, even if it cuts against the market. <laughs> see what I mean? Go right ahead, my brother. Oh, in the, in the back there. Oh, yeah. Good afternoon, Brother West. How you doing, my brother? I'm good. And yourself? I'm blessed, though, man. I uh, hear. Um, can you put into simple context uh, the basis for uh, the, the lie of white supremacy uh, for, for our clarity and edification? And is it necessary for that understanding moving forward with clarity to, to make any, any difference in, in the road of love and peace? Well, I appreciate that. Well, one, of course, is that uh, probably the best thing to do is to read the great W.B. Du Bois. You read two, two texts. You read The Souls of Black Folk, and then he wrote an essay called The Souls of White Folk. They go together. And he shows the way in which the lie of white supremacy emerged at a particular moment, both to rationalize and justify the ex exploitation of labor because of a deep fear of black bodies and the inability to relate to those bodies on a human level, especially as it relates to sexuality and the, and the circulation of desires as it relates to one's sexuality. So you got psychic, you got political, you got economic, social, and political dimensions all part of this vicious lie and legacy of white supremacy that takes off in the early, early modern Europe, and early modern Europe tied to the slave trade, becomes crystallized, legalized, and because it is a social construct, it is a fiction, but it's so real because it's been institutionalized and legalized through our educational system, through sciences, through religion, and so forth and so on. Then you want to always look at those who resist it. You want to look at those who resist it intellectually, Politically, socially, we should never forget about white brothers like uh, um, my dear brother uh, at the uh, Highlander Center, Miles Horton. What a giant. Ann Braden, white sister, tied into the black struggle. You know, Miles Horton's vanilla wife helped write We Shall Overcome, which was the anthem of the black freedom struggle. Black folk have always embraced other people's contributions, no matter what color they are. We, we, we wasn't worried that a white system would help write the, the anthem. Sound, sound good. You know, that's, that was fine. But we understand standards. See, when you look at the Grammys and you see Sam Smith and Robin Thicke and Justin Timberlake think that they're part of the legacy of Donny Hathaway and Marvin Gaye, you say, we appreciate the effort. <laughs> appreciate the effort. Don't get it twisted. And it's a challenge to the young black artists to master craft and technique to be true to Aretha and be true to Luther Vandross and be true to the Whispers and so forth. And if you don't have that discipline, then you're going to end up with some vanilla folk thinking somehow that they're the embodiment of Marvin Gaye when they're lucky to be the second cousins of Hall and Oates. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm meddling now. Okay, I'll let them, we got to go. go ahead. Um, <clears throat> My question is, what is the role of higher education in, sh in generating the social change that uh, Radical King spoke of? And what is the role of students and administrators at higher educational institutions in holding the system accountable for generating change? Oh, powerful question, especially at University of Chicago. Especially at University of Chicago. I mean, this is the bastion of the caretaker of the Western tradition and its canon and its great works and so forth. So that looked like Brother Nate right there. That's Brother Nate. Yes, indeed. We're talking about you. So saluting you, brother. But uh, uh, and so a place like Chicago, same is true for Harvard, Yale, or Berkeley, and so forth, that we know the West has much to give, but we also know about the barbarism of the West. So the West has to be honest about its own will to truth and truthful about its barbarism. You see. But that means what? And this is something that universities rarely dispense or put a premium on. 
which as I was talking about before, courage. So universities have rarely been on the cutting edge of struggles for justice. They usually come in kicking and screaming, trying to finish their dissertations as to what's going on in the street as other folk are getting shot. Now that, isn't, that doesn't mean the universities have played no role, but universities are places where people are socialized into conformity to be part of a hierarchy and a ranking to think highly of themselves and to believe they're sophisticated, refined, and somehow part of the elite. Now, there are some pleasures. I mean, I'm a kind of intellectual hedonist. I get a certain pleasure out of reading Plato and Toni Morrison and Shakespeare. There's no doubt about that. I love it. You see. But I don't mistake it for a substitute of trying to muster the courage to tell the truth, especially in my own present context and situation. You see. So you have to make sure you add on your stress on courage. And courage means what? Taking a risk. Courage means what? Going to the edge. Courage means what? Sacrificing your popularity for integrity. That, that, that cuts against the grain. But of course, we know it's going on. It's going, but it has to be continuous. It has to be a chronic part. And I know when I was going to school, we, I, was, I, I was working the Black Panther Party a breakfast program and I worked in prisons even then at Norfolk with the brothers when I was at Harvard. It was always not just an additive or a, uh, a ornamental thing, it became constitutive of who I was as a person as I sat in the classrooms with my dear brothers John Rawls and Hillary Putnam and Stanley Cavell and Robert Nozick and some of those who were so kind and loving to me, you see. So in that sense, you want to have a broader sense, get out of the bubble, connect to everyday people, be multi-contextual. Don't get caught in one context. It's too narrow. That's what a jazz woman does, you see. She's flexible, fluid, improvisational, and multi-contextual. See what I mean? Cassandra Wilson can sing folk sounds and songs and make it sound like it was wrote in, in Delta, Mississippi, because she brings the blues with her when she does it. She's multi-contextual. We learn from, in many ways, the great vanguard of the species who are the artists and musicians. And for black folk, it is very special to learn from the musicians because it's been in music that we found most self-confidence, self-respect, freedom, and a foretaste of what we could be when we found ourselves in structures of unfreedom and unfairness. Thanks so much, though, brother. Uh -huh. Dr. West, I want to thank you for your, your presentation today. It was truly a thinker's presentation. Thank you, and my What brother. I wanted to do is ask you to repeat the four questions. Yes, I thought yes. you were going to re return to them at the end because I wanted to capture them so I can take them back to my classroom. Ooh, that's beautiful. How shall integrity face oppression? And what does honesty do in the face of deception? Of course, these questions for everybody in terms of wrestling what it means to be human. And then what does decency do in the face of insult, oh brother? And the last one having to do with the police and the FBI and the CIA, and I'm sure we probably got some here and we appreciate they're here doing their job. <laughs> How does virtue meet brute force? I'm here in Chicago, Fred Hampton, just say his name. Fred Hampton, mm -hmm. courageous brother. Love shot off through him, shot down like a dog, FBI. It's wrong, it's immoral, it's unjust. And he wasn't the only one. So many others, you see. Those four questions take you right to the center of what it is to be human and right at the center of how we ought to respond to any social regime. And you can imagine the profoundly democratic implications of the answers that were given by Martin King and the others. We're going to put at the center poor and working people. We're going to put at the center those friends for no one called the wretched of the earth. They have priority. And thank God that Palestinian Jew named Jesus had already talked about the priority of the least of these. 
He got it from our Jewish brothers and sisters, from Hebrew scripture, from Amos and Micah and Isaiah and the others. Go right ahead, my brother. Thank you, Dr. West. Thank you so much Thank for you to me. taking questions. Um, so I think my question is about integrity meeting deceit and uh, the welcoming that the city of Chicago is doing for our president. And um, it seems to me that in this tradition of artists that you, you might think of Barack Obama coming back as uh, Lepakin coming back to the estate uh, in, in Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard, knowing mm. full well what needs to happen, how we need to sell everything off. And uh, I don't know how to show uh, tenderness towards that or whether or not it's uh, integrity that he's putting out there when he endorses a mayoral candidate in this city who could very well be described as a Jewish pharaoh. Are you talking about Brother Rahm Emanuel? I'm talking about, yeah, the president talking about Rahm Emanuel like yes. he's Chicago's mayor, which I, I don't, I, you know, it seems like he might be the mayor of Evanston or some, some other city, but... I, <laughs> no, I hear you. Because we have a candidate, Chewy Garcia, who is, you know, also running. And I wonder, you know, in the spirit of tenderness, how should we welcome this endorsement? No, I think that you should uh, lovingly and militantly oppose it. I mean, we fought, Brother Flager knows, we fought tooth and nail against Rom in and out. But I mean, I've been fighting against Rom for 25 years. Uh, uh, so that, that's, that's just a matter of consistency. That's why when he was chosen to be chief of staff, you know, I, I said to myself, my dear brother Barack, after my 65 events for you, if I had known that's who you were going to choose, if I had known you're going to choose Tim Geithner and Larry Summers, I would have been much less enthusiastic about my support. Now, of course, Palin and McCain you want to hold it on length. So that's, it's a relative judgment in that sense. But, uh, uh, but the, the idea of a, uh, uh, the kind of neoliberal figures, anytime they see a problem, they got the neoliberal response. What is it? Financialize, privatize, militarize. Financialize, privatize, militarize. Public schools in problem, privatize. You, you want order? Militarize. Big banks running things anyway. What is it now? 1% of the population own 43% of the banks. The banks get almost 40% of the profits. 30 years ago, it was multinational corporations. Now it's big banks. Least corporations used to produce products like cars. The banks just produce deals that stays in their private pockets. Billions, 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 billions of dollars in their private pocket. And yet, when it comes to have a penny for a quality educational system, can't find the money. <laughs> Decent housing, can't find the money. Jobs with a living wage, living wage, can't find the money. No, you got work priorities, that's what you got. So you just tell the president very kindly, brother, you got work priorities, you ought to be ashamed of yourself by invoking Martin Luther King Jr. when you sanitize him and somehow reinforce your own neoliberal financializing, privatizing, and militarizing policy. That's all, you can still love him. <laughs> I'm honest about that. I'm honest about that. The vicious white supremacists who attack Barack Obama, I'm against them. If a police was beating Barack Obama because he's a black man, I'm swinging at the police. But after the moment, we're going to have a conversation. I'm going to tell that president why he's wrong. I hate white supremacy. No matter who it is, they could be beating up Clarence Thomas. I got to push, I got to side with Clarence at that moment. And that's a real brief moment of solidarity. <laughs> but white supremacy is wrong, no matter who is attacked, black, brown, red, or whatever. Then you're going to deal with your other issues in that way. And the idea that the president will ever be able to convince Fox News brothers and sisters is just such a joke, it's a farce. They're going to lie on him no matter what. He keeps reaching out, reaching out, reaching out as if he thinks somehow that's courageous. No, that's a sign of weakness. And never forget what Martin said. Martin was a pacifist. He was a pacifist, but he said, cowardice is worse than violence. That's what Martin said. And he was echoing Gandhi. Gandhi was an absolute pacifist. And you look at his essay, The Doctrine of the Sword, he says that, if I had to choose between cowardice and violence, I would choose violence. That's Gandhi. And of course, the connection of Martin and Gandhi is very tight, and I talk about it in the book. 
cowardice reinforces the callousness and the indifference, which is the very center of King's conception of sin. Hardening of heart, coarsening of conscience, cold, callous, cowardly. That's why even they would talk about choosing violence. Ooh, that, that's serious language for pacifists. Because I'm not a pacifist. I'm a Christian, but I'm not a pacifist. I'll tell you that right now. Somebody show up in my crib. Oh, Lord. But <laughs> who's next? Thank you so much, my brother. Go right ahead. Dr. West, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, it's really great to have you here, especially given the weather that we have in Chicago. But nonetheless, as you can see by this room being full, we, we really appreciate the words you have to say. My question here, though, really comes to the fact in terms of um, the issues related to working people in this country. As you just mentioned earlier, you know, 1% now has 43% of the entire assets in this world. And I think the problem for us nowadays is as these neo-economic liberal policies continue to be spread throughout our country, Country, what do working people have to hold on to in order for hope, in order for change, especially when you got two brothers in Kansas City, I mean Kansas, that are about to spend $1 billion in the upcoming elections? What does it mean for our particular democracy nowadays where we are going into a theocracy or an oligarchy? What do working people have to hold on to? And I think the last bit of it is that, you know, before government was able to provide certain things, now, because of the reducing of the revenue stream for some of these, some of these governmental entities, that we have so many non-for-profits that have to go begging at the hands of the multinational corporations Absolutely. for grants, that they no longer can self-sustain each other. What do working people have to hold on to nowadays? Mm, well, that was a wonderful question, though, brother. <laughs> wonderful question, definitely. I mean, there's no doubt with, with, with most of the wealth hemorrhaged at the top, that it's nearly impossible for most fellow citizens to survive without gaining some access to those resources. I mean, look at the civil rights organization these days. You see, usually they're more and more now supported by corporations, which imposes limits on what they can say. You know, if Wells Fargo is providing a significant percentage of your budget, you're not going to engage in a critique of Wells Fargo. If Walmart's providing a significant amount, you're not going to engage in the kind of struggle for living wage against the oligarchic presence and exploitative practices of Walmart. So people get caught in that way. Working people have at their disposal the ability to choose, to organize, to be part of the fight back in some form, oftentimes given the narrowness of the electoral political system, because so much of our electoral political system these days is characterized by legalized bribery and normalized corruption. That's really what much of it is. You got a Bernie Sanders here, Elizabeth Warren, twice, two days a week maybe, uh, uh, making populist noises, that's fine, but she's still so much tied into the Clintonite network that is neoliberal and tied to the big banks as well. It's hard to find politicians who have enough autonomy and courage to speak the truth. You, nothing wrong with getting behind them, but you had to be part of poor people's organizations, working people's organizations, and to raise your voice in any context, in any context. And look at the history of black people. What, what, what have we really had as a people? We've had family, faith, music, some community infrastructures, but usually very, very weak. But we've always had subversive memory. And that's one of the reasons why market culture is trying to erase subversive memory among our young people. If they can erase subversive memory, then all they'll have is just consumer-driven zombies who can't wait to conceive the next moment in the mall with no sense of what went into who they are and no sense of their history, no sense of all the blood, sweat, and tears that, that has been displayed for them to be who they are. But that's what working people, in many ways, that's all working people have too. So in that sense, I'm just saying you got to be part of the fight back, but don't get discouraged. That's part of being long-distance runner, though. It's always look bad. So what? There's nothing new. Look bad. 50 years ago for grandmama, look bad 100 years ago for great grandmama. What did they do at their best? They stood their ground. They kept loving. They kept swinging like Ella Fitzgerald and Duke Ellington. So on those Friday nights, they were so free that even the folk with big money want to get in on the freedom. Ain't that something? They got to go to Buddy, Buddy Guy's place to get some freedom, even though they got billions of dollars dropping out of their pocket. How come you can't get it on your side of town? Well, 
Our folk not free as you. How we so free and we broke as the Ten Commandments financially? What's going on? <laughs> oh, we got to tell that history, but we won't tell it now. Go right ahead, though. Hello, sir. How are you doing? How you doing, my brother? Good to I'm see you. I'm doing well. I'm a student at the Moody Bible Institute. Yes. And just in retrospect, looking at how Fred Hampton responded to the leadership of Bobby Seale and Martin King and Malcolm X, and even when Martin King called clergy uh, to action in Selma, yes. what is the response uh, from your standpoint or even uh, from Michelle Alexander's standpoint and how we should fight or respond to this new Jim Crow? Like, what, what should us students do? Yeah, I appreciate the question and, and salute the work that you're doing, my brother. Salute the work that you're doing. Well, one is when you look at this magnificent, with Marvin, with Marvin, with Martin Luther King Jr., when he looked at, at SNCC, what did he call it? He said, this marvelous wave of new militancy among the youth. That's his language. Well, that's exactly what we're, Ferguson, what that, what we're witnessing right now, not just in Ferguson, but in parts of the country, and in many ways the world, in many ways the world. So what does that mean? It means then that you've got to be able to understand where that militancy comes from. This is not the first wave. You understand the waves that came before, early in the 20th century and so forth. Insights as well as shortcomings. Right? That's that sense of history, right? And be connected with folk, my dear brother, who are on the same wavelength as you in terms of committing themselves to live a life of courage and vision. You see, it's like, like in a jazz quartet, you got to get in the pocket, brother. Once you get in that pocket with other folk who's grooving in that way, spiritually, politically, socially, you find yourself moving quicker than you would if you were in other contexts. And that's exactly what Martin and the others were looking for. It is never, ever a movement of the majority. Never, you see. Birmingham, Montgomery, it was a slice of black churches. It wasn't all of them. And you all know here in Chicago, J.H. Jackson, one of the finest lyrical ministers in the history of the preach word. But Lord, he had it for Martin, didn't he? Woo, he was against Martin Luther King Jr. Pushed him out of the National Baptist Convention. Martin had to find his own convention, the Progressive Baptist Convention with, with Gardner Taylor and others. And what would Martin say if he had preached the last sermon? The name of that sermon was, America May Go to Hell. That was a sermon he was going to preach right the Sunday after he was killed. And that's not our dear brother Jeremiah right now, y'all. That's Martin Luther King Jr. See, Brother Jeremiah Wright, misunderstood, underappreciated. He will be vindicated. But Martin said, America may go to hell. He didn't say America should go to hell. He didn't say America ought to go to hell. He said, this marvelous new militancy of these young folk, if they stay in the pocket with integrity, honesty, decency, and courage, they're going to present a challenge, and if America can't come to terms with its materialism, militarism, and racism and poverty, America will go to hell like every empire in the history of the world. You can believe in American exceptionalism all you want, but America is in no way an exception when it comes to the viruses that squeeze out the democratic energies that make your economy oligarchic, that makes so much of your society still pigmentocratic like Hollywood looks more like the National Hockey League <laughs> than any other institution. You can't sustain it. Young folk making a fundamental difference. C couple more questions. I know I've gone on much too long, but I'm just, um, so, but I'm glad my voice is holding. I was praying my voice would hold out. Go right ahead. Sir, I'm, I'm from South Africa, yes. and um, we've been watching the events in Ferguson for example, with much sadness. But at the same time, you're very curious about what and how this relates to us um, as outsiders, as people who are often at the end of, uh, at the wrong end of American foreign policy. So if the United States battles to treat its own people, its own black and brown bodies with dignity, how can we expect the world to be treated in a more equitable way? Mm. No, I, I think in, in this, you're very eloquent. I, I, think, I think the answer's right there in your question, though, brother. 
that the hypocrisy becomes overwhelming. There's no doubt about it. But I think because the South Africa has meant so much to us here in the black freedom movement, that it's very important that we keep track of the black neoliberal elites in South Africa who will invoke the black freedom struggle but will pursue the same tendencies that financialize, privatize, and militarize vis-a-vis -vis black working and poor people in South Africa. So that you end up with repressive apparatus. You know about the situation of killing the workers. You know about the situation of struggle with the unions vis-a-vis -vis the, the ANC and so forth. You see very parallel developments taking place and there's got to be the truth tellers and the witness bearers in both contexts to be able to come together, work together, and keep track of the black neoliberal elites in South Africa and in the United States. It's very similar kinds of patterns of behavior. And of course, this is after the death of our dear, dear brother, the one and only uh, brother Nelson Mandela, who was on the US terrorist list until 2006. Beginning of an answer. Thanks so much. Here we go. Just a couple. Of, just last one. Okay, so it's up to you because I'm I'm fine. I don't have to. Uh, what time we got? We, we got the American Library Association, huh? Oh, yo, I got to sign some books. Oh, yeah, we came here to talk about sell, sell books too, huh? What well, the important thing is, love Martin, wrestle with Martin, and buy the book if you're so inclined. But I'm not just promoting it. I'm talking about a cause, not a brand. I don't believe in brands. I don't believe in commercials and advertisements. I believe in living lives. And you can buy books while you live, but it's not a brand. Go right ahead. Peace and blessings, Bobby, Dr. West. I've been reading your books ever since um, I've had to get a dictionary for every other word. Oh, my God, my God. I adore you, I, I honor you uh, in every sense of the word. Thank you so much. I have much, two, two questions, very quick questions. One, I just finished an opportunity to live in the kingdom of Swaziland, Southern Africa. And I lived there for two years. I had an opportunity to do that. Uh, I was with the US Peace Corps and I'm one of the few Americans who have been a United States Marine and the United States Peace Corps as well. Wow, wow, wow. God bless you, God bless you, my brother. God bless you, man. Uh, stu studying me and my history and, and trying to understand and in inculcate those things that Big Mama told me about mm. uh, back in the 70s and 80s, uh, looking at, at the, the, the youth that I, that I mentor here and having an opportunity to go to a school, a high school, 700 students, a elementary school, 300 students in the mm. kingdom of Swaziland, and I was there for two years, and mm. I never saw one fight. Wow, wow. I never saw one fight. What I'm trying to, 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 to ask, my question is, in terms of identity, uh, Dr. Naeem Akbar in his book, Know Thyself, talked about how identity is the first uh, 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 prerequisite for education, uh, identity. How do we teach our youth in a real truthful way? Apparently what we've been doing has not been working. How do we get our youth, especially black youth, to incorporate more with identity and coming to know thyself? That's my first question. And my second Ooh, question is- That's your first one, Lord. Yes. <laughs> Oh, you and got my, some my deep second stuff. one is a very is a very out. quick question. Uh, after going to uh, the kingdom of Swaziland, I bought a lot of stuff there, and I have a necklace that I that I have that I would like to give you, and I was wondering if you would accept it. Oh, absolutely, my brother, <laughs> absolutely, definitely. Thank yeah, come you. on up, come on up, though, brother. You just bring that bring that necklace on up. This, this, this idea of our young people being in webs of empathy 
and ties of sympathy so that they don't have to trash each other, disrespect each other. You see, in the United States, we are a country whose dominant myth is the frontier. And the frontier implies in part moral regeneration through violence. That's why we're one of the most violent people of all of modern peoples. Canada has the same number of peoples as California. More Californians kill each other with knives than Canadians kill each other with anything. See, so that's culture. Then you add poverty. You see, we got 40% of our precious children, black and brown and red and yellow, live in poverty, 40%. That's a crime against humanity, you see. Now, granted, that's not the only thing, because I, mean, I was blessed. You can see this right here. See, this is from Ethiopia, you right? That's from Mercado, Addis Ababa, right? Now, when I lived in Ethiopia, Ethiopia, Addis Ababa is a major metropolitan center, right? You got millions of folk in Ethiopia, I mean, in Addis Ababa. When I was living there, there were only seven murders in the whole city for the year. Now, Chicago, if y'all had that, y'all would be breakdancing all week long, right? But no, 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 in America, it was violence for indigenous peoples. It was violent repressions of the working class movement. It was vicious violence against women. Look at the domestic violence going on right now every second with these insecure brothers who don't have the courage to confront the boss and got to come home and trash the sister because somehow you think that makes you feel like you Superman or something. Or you got to attack the gay brothers and the lesbian sisters, or the precious trans, or the precious bisexuals. It's that moral regeneration that is a profoundly American myth. And it's sick, it's pathological. That doesn't mean we haven't had Americans who were countering that, that story, because there's a counter narrative, there's a counter tradition that's part of America too. Right. But, where you were is very different. I don't know the history there. And of course, we got violence in every civilization, but America has a particular kind of preoccupation with it. Look, look at the movie, for example. Selma came out alongside another movie named what? American Sniper. Selma's got won $39 million. The sniper's going on $240 million. And then you add that, $20 million given to Sister Ava. She's magnificent in that film. $20 million given for Martin. There's a dog with dirty ears from London named Paddington. That film got $60 million. So you get $60 million for Paddington, $20 million for Martin, and American Sniper makes two hundred and thirty. million. And which one is both Paddington and Sniper were violent? Selma was violent too. But all oh, was violence against black bodies. That doesn't have the weight, the gravitas. That's normalized. That's routinized. They young folk been criminalized anyway. So them killing each other is almost part of the logic itself. That's part of the white supremacist legacy. But then the young folk too often consent to it. How do we break that consent? We can learn something from Africa. What did they have in Africa? At their best, I know I saw it in Ethiopia. Unbelievable yes, self. Yes, <laughs> it wasn't it something. Yeah, it was. It's a beautiful thing. And just learning the culture alone. It, and just the culture alone is 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 enough. It 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 took me about a year just to adapt, uh, but it was it was something else. And then I started to see, wow, this is us. It's us. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a beautiful thing. But every culture has its challenges. I'm sure they got too much patriarchy and homophobia over there, too. But I'm so, so we don't want to, we want to idealize. But when it comes to young folk not killing each other, oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. Well, Brother Flager sees it in the basketball league. With the brothers playing basketball all night, they get a chance to interact across gangs. They see things they have in common. They have different conceptions of honor. It's connected much more to achievement on the court than it is to putting each other down, you get a change and a transformation. But we still, in the end, we really talking about love. We back to Coltrane's Love Supreme. That's, that's, that's really what we're talking about. And that's really what we all want in the end, you know. And if you got frustrated, neglected love, you're gonna end up with a life of certain kind of spiritual vacuity. And everybody wants a certain kind of connection, a sense of belonging that has quality to it. You all are so kind. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, man. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. 
Oh, let me go back there. Oh, let, let me holler at him. Uh, okay. Man, I'm being contact with you. Be in contact, your brother. Love y'all, love y'all, man. Uh, I'll see you, see you in the thing. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, how you doing, my brother? So as promised, we're going to have a, a brief book signing with Dr. West. We're going to give him a minute to catch his breath. 